blew his top and sat down to write down 95 points of debate that he wanted to be discussed at his university in Wittenberg. Uh, points of debate that would lead him hope to a reform of the church. And of course, that's the infamous 95 theses nailed on the door of the Catholic Church in Wittenberg, October 31st, 1517. Uh, throughout uh, Germany, this Johann Tetzel, who died this past week, he infamously preached. He had a little jingle to go with his sales pitch. This was this little uh, preaching jingle that he sold indulgences. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Kind of catchy. Now, referring to the, to the Reformation, which caught everyone, including Luther, by surprise, though he once called Tessel the primary author of this tragedy, when he heard that Tessel lay dying, he wrote him a letter of comfort. And in that letter he said, Don't take it too hard. You didn't start this racket. Well, we pick up our, our journey in uh, Acts chapter 19, and I invite you again to open your Bibles, your phones, and we're going to be looking at some verses there. You can see the opening words of uh, chapter 19. Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples, some believers in Jesus. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? And they replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Yes, you shall be my witnesses. Welcome back to this series. You shall be my witnesses, Jesus said. Uh, shall we be Christ's witnesses. Um, this encounter in Ephesus and those who confess we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit might have something to do with how we answer the question of whether we shall be Christ's witnesses. Well, by now, most of you have heard the news that my time of being a pastor here at Atonement, after uh, nearly 16 full years, is coming to a close. September 19th will be my last Sunday, just uh, six Sundays counting today from now. And um, I apologize to those who are hearing this for the first time. I am. Um, I especially regret when visitors come to church and uh, get to hear such news. I um, want everyone to know of my health, heart, heart, felt care in sharing this news. Um, I, um, I appreciate that several of you have said, you've gone out of your way to say to me personally that you're happy for me and um, you wish me well in, in what's happening. And, even though um, this uh, transition that I am about, where I will, um, at the end of September, be the full-time pastor, transition pastor at a church called Grace in Grafton, uh, and that uh, my work there will also allow me to continue to explore uh, some consulting work that my mentor had asked me to consider being part of his team at Church Innovations um, about a year ago, I can continue to explore what what could be a useful role in my life as um, I approach retirement years that aren't so far away. Um, people like me need to stay active and feel useful, and I'm, I know it's uh, time for me to explore this next stage in my life, but uh, though I appreciate your being happy for me, I must say that right now, this whole thing is uh, feels more wise than, uh, than pleasant. Well, how does this fit into our journey in Acts this week? 
Last week we um, we walked through chapter 17, and we saw in the historic city of Athens how um, people are, are are idol makers or little god factories. Um, we find things, uh, experiences, people, objects, items, places to become somewhat like our God, even to the point of forgetting that there's the Holy Spirit. And I have to confess to you all that uh, you are some of my gods and goddesses. Now, I know that's not a surprise to some of you who have known that you are a god or a goddess already. But um, by that, I mean that um, I there's been two experiences in what's now into my 37th year of ministry that have been the most um, horribly agonizing, I say, with all sincerity in my life. That was uh, the first time when I felt the need to transition away from beloved all people back in 2005 and come to be pastor here. Um, and now, of course, this transition. It's been horribly agonizing for me, I, I have to confess. It's, um, it's the least appealing part of being a pastor. I remember being a little boy, looking at pastors growing up, and um, I, I thought to myself, you know, as I pondered what in the world I would do in my life, and it was just a fleeting thought, and it took many years and a whole bunch of other anguish to figure out what to do with my life. But in my little boy's brain, I remember looking up at the pastor saying, I could probably do that. Because they have to sing, you know, the Lutheran liturgy. <laughs> and I figured even I could carry it to them. And, and, uh, and, and they, they needed to, um, they needed to like people, which I did and do. And, um, and yet I remember as a little boy watching pastors that would transition from our little town and and I thought, how awful that is, because, you know, well, my mother lived for 85 years in the same house, and her church was for 85 years old and Lutheran, and why would people not be able to always, always be together? Even as a child, I thought that was a strange, strange part of becoming a pastor. I'll, I won't forget, when I left all people, I'll never forget, I, I felt such shame if you're an Enneagram 3, remember, I know a lot of you went down this Enneagram route for us last Lent, and some of you are like, oh, don't remind me. But anyway, if you're an Enneagram 3 like me, then when you go through things where you disappoint um, people, possibly, you feel um, like a failure. And, uh, and Enneagram 3s like me just feel shame about transition. It's just in my gut. And I remember at all people's back in 2005, I felt such shame abandoning all those children that I just felt God had allowed me to be there for, for so many years. And uh, I felt such shame. And, and, and uh, one of the moms of some of those kids, a woman named Marie, came up to me and she said, um, she looked at me and she said, I just wish you would have told us that this could happen. Meaning that I would possibly leave someday. I just wish you had told us this could happen. And then she went on to explain where we come from. The pastor is there and, and grows old and, and dies, and then their sons take over. <laughs> and I kind of chuckled, and I said, I don't know which one of my sons you want. I, I could make a recommendation, and it probably would be my daughter, but anyway. <laughs> Because congregational transitions, and there's the number of atonement people and people who come to atonement from other churches who know well that transitions in congregations are not a simple thing. Um, it's a season of great stewardship. And we know what stewardship means. It's how do we manage what God has given us. And, and so part of my agonizing over transition has been how do we steward, how do we manage this season of transition in a healthy way? Uh, five years ago, uh, believe it or not, Ron Peterson and I and 
Greg Young's and Cindy Gospel. We read a book called The Elephant in the Boardroom, which was a book that, uh, if you can imagine that metaphor, the elephant in the boardroom is something nobody, nobody in the board wants to talk about. And it's true, church councils and church leaders would rather not talk about a pastor leaving if things are going relatively well. But we began to read that years ago, and, and thankfully we've done some things in these last number of years to build some stability into this congregation, not the least of which is the presence of beloved Pastor Kevin and a whole bunch of staff that I just ask you to pray for and appreciate and support and, um, and just ask them how you can help. You know, Jeannie Coughlin's going to need people to step up in September if you can possibly serve on Sunday. Just say, Jeannie, put me in. Uh, we need people to do that. But this, um, this transition is, um, it, it, it is challenging in, in church life, can be. And so we began over the last couple of years to talk about a time when we would roll up our sleeves and study this carefully. And, and that time became last spring. And so we, um, we began to appoint a guiding leadership team, an excellent a bunch of leaders in this church. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I don't have their names in front of you, but I see Lori and Mark are here, and Ron Peterson, and, and Wendy and J.D., and uh, Cindy Dostal, and Matt Luckman, and Chris Retzloff, and Rachel Zabkowitz, and Tim Fairbrother, and there's one more. I'm forgetting. Oh, this is horrible. Well, maybe my brain will kick in to gear. But you, just from that wonderful list, you... Um, you know that uh, the hours that we have spent, and I know Lori and Mark will share with you that it's far more hours than they would rather spend with me, but <laughs> we have rolled up our sleeves in order that uh, this church would have a sense of clarity about next steps and confidence about discerning the process that will allow atonement to. Um, to select uh, a new pastor and chart a course for our future future ministry. And I really want you to be very hopeful because, uh, to be honest, this work that we have done, I honestly do not know of another congregation. I'm told there are some. I'm sure there are some, but there's some 8,500 ESDA churches in the United States, and it's just not our norm to do this kind of careful work. We've had the blessing of our bishop. And uh, specifically, uh, Pastor Jennifer Arnold, the bishop's assistant, has participated personally in this process. You'll get to know her better in a few months ahead. And so I want you to feel uh, a sense that there's clarity, confidence, and hope as we uh, unfold. You'll be getting more information about how you will be asked to be involved in the discernment process not too far down the road. Well, again, what does all this have to do with our journey into Acts? Well, you can see on this next slide that uh, Paul is in his third missionary journey. We finished his second missionary journey last week. We skipped chapter 18, but if you look at chapter 18, you're going to hear about the year and a half that he spent in Corinth. You're going to hear about his going back to Antioch, which was his home base of training where he would spend time with other apostles. The center of the church in those first 15 years after Jesus' ascension moved from Jerusalem to Antioch because of the persecution in Jerusalem that had heated up so much. And, uh, and that was where Paul went back to get some retread. Nowadays we have missionaries who come home for a few weeks and a few months to get refreshed before they go back. Paul would come back to Antioch, and now he entered out in his third journey, and he uh, arrives at the city of Ephesus, where he spent two years. You know that Ephesus became a pretty important place to him because there is a monumental book of scripture, which is the letter to the Ephesians, that Paul, at the end of his life, uh, helped shape and was likely finished even after his death and formed into this monumental uh, description of what it is 
to be a follower of Jesus, the mature thoughts of Paul, closer to the end of his life in the letter to the Ephesians. Well, this Ephesus is, um, is quite a place, uh, and certainly was an amazing place. History books tell us that Ephesus was a trade route from uh, the Greek peninsula to the left on this map into what the Roman Empire called Asia. Essentially, there is what is now modern day Turkey. They considered that the Asian province of the Roman Empire beginning the far western uh, realm. Ephesus was right out of the trade route and had become a major center, prosperous, highly cultured, wealthy, populous. It was one of the jewels of the Roman Empire crown. Now, signifying some of the grandeur of us, to take a look at this picture. Some of us saw this just two years ago in May. Down in the lower right-hand corner is, a, a, is, is the way it, it, an amphitheater, a 25,000 seat amphitheater exists to this day in Ephesus. And this particular setting takes prominence in the 19th chapter of Acts. Artists have, have made an attempt to show us what it would have looked like in the time of Paul and when it was at its peak. Um, you can't tell from the picture, even in the artist rendering, but at the time of Paul, this was right on the edge of the Mediterranean, the bay that was the trading port in the, in the five, in the thousands and hundreds and hundreds of years since. That area has tilted up, but you can kind of picture this stadium, this amphitheater in Ephesus in the manner that, well, for example, uh, brewers are playing out at PNC Park, and you look out in that beautiful field, and you see three rivers, the confluence of the three rivers. I liked it when it was Three Rivers Stadium, by the way. But anyway, um, and, or maybe you go to Oracle Field and San Francisco, you get a home run, and it lands in the, in the ocean. <laughs> um, that's what it was like there in this gorgeous seaside port of Ephesus at the time of Paul. Open your Bibles to chapter 19, verse 24. In Ephesus, about that time, it says in verse 23, there was uh, no little disturbance that broke out concerning the way. Kind of a, a beautiful little moment to realize that even though the word Christian had begun to emerge, as we preached and taught a few weeks ago, they still called themselves people of the way. The, the way of what? The way of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Messiah, Jesus. The, the people of the way, no little disturbance arose. A man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis. Let me pause there. How many of us had to study the Greek gods in school? Yeah, I don't know. Why, why did we do that? Zeus and Hera and all the... I mean, I don't know what that was about, but we, we did. Artemis was a Greek god that was thought to be Zeus's daughter, the goddess of childbirth. They had a god and a goddess for everything in Greek mythology. And, um, and this Artemis had been made into a little statue that if you read the scripture carefully in 19, you'll find that they, they believe it dropped out of heaven. We've heard religions say that. There's various religions say that, you know, their holy book dropped out of heaven or whatever. Um, it's not unusual. But um, in this case, they made, uh, well, you can read for yourself, a man named Demetrius Silversmith made silver shrines uh, uh, to Artemis that brought no little business to the artisans. There he, he gathered the workers of the same trade, those that worked on these uh, little artifacts of Artemis, and said, Men, you know that we get our wealth from this business. Maybe he said, You know we get our wealth from this business. I don't know. But you get the idea. We get our wealth from this business. You can also see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost the whole of Asia, Remember they called that reason, region Asia. In the whole of Asia, this Paul, this Paul, has persuaded 
and brought away a considerable number of people by saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the goddess Artemis, there was a grand temple, the ruins are still there, you can see in Ephesus. The, the, the temple of the goddess Artemis will be scorned. She will be deprived of her majesty and brought, that brought all Asia and the world to worship her. Well, you can read on in chapter 19, a riot ensues, and uh, they begin to speak the uh, people of the way, looking for Paul and, and his entourage and travelers, they found some of them, they dragged them to that amphitheater. And if you know anything about public spectacles in Roman and Greek culture, they had to be terrified about what was going to happen in, in those kinds of settings. And, uh, and Paul himself, they did not find, but Paul wanted to go. He wanted to be in the thick of things. And, and some of those who were with him just held him back and kept him safe. As the riot exploded in the amphitheater and they were ready to tear these people apart, uh, 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 a, a civic leader by the name of Alexander, we read in chapter 19, stepped forward and, and persuaded the crowd that the Roman Empire would be much more irritated by their rioting than they would by any dispute that they were having over a religious idol. And so the, um, the situation de-escalated. Well, in a sense, this, um, this moment with Paul and the Ephesians, it connects to the time that's unfolding in our lives. Uh, like the Ephesians, perhaps like me, you may uh, be, as we said last Sunday, an idol maker or a little god maker. It's very natural, it's very human, it's completely normal to become devoted to uh, things, to prize our possessions, our money. Uh, people are naturally very important to us and should be, and our relationships, um, our, our jobs, our work, our, our meaning and purpose in life, these things are naturally uh, very important to us. It's only human. But we learned last week that the way God has fashioned this world, like it or not, all of these idols, all of these little gods in our life, at some point are turned upside down. It's uh, part of our human life. What happens when we are so upset? What happens? when we wonder what happens when our little gods are turned upside down. We can be so upset that we can live as though we never knew the Holy Spirit. As though um, we were not even aware that there was a Holy Spirit. In the face of the, um, the hoax of the relics and the sham uh, of the indulgences, Luther taught that God and His grace are to be received freely by each and every human being without cost, without earning. That this grace and love of God is absolutely accessible to every one of us. And it, it is true, isn't it, that we, in the midst of transitions in our life and change-induced stress, like me, perhaps you can just get horribly anguish. What in the world? And we can forget that there's a Holy Spirit. We can forget 
how much God loves each one of us right now for the sake of Jesus. How He loved us so much that God offered Himself in His Son. So as we look upon our children and our grandchildren and our love just dwells in our life, you can know that that's how God looks on you and me. And in the depth of that love, we can hear Jesus speak and remind us there is a Holy Spirit. And He breathed on them and gave them His Holy Spirit and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. How He taught them and teaches us that when we study God's Word and we incorporate God's commandments into our lives, God makes a home in our heart. And what is hidden in our heart can never be taken away. It's there for us to tap into in any dark night of the soul. We can hear Jesus reminding His disciples when He was preparing them for His departure, I will not leave you orphaned. But the Holy Spirit will come to you, the Comforter, who will remind you of everything I have taught. And we can praise God for the gift of that Spirit in our life. Instead of in times of stress, we allow ourselves to be gripped by frustration or anger or regret or should have or why. Only natural to feel some anger, but instead of being caught there, instead of being trapped in anxiety about the future and the unknowns and afraid to step forth, instead of falling into despair and, and sadness and being left there. You can ask God to give us the gifts of the Spirit again today. I invite you to take a breath and just receive those gifts of being among the gentle ones on this earth, the patient ones, the kind ones, the generous ones, the ones who persevere. And the ones who are filled with love for all humanity. I got to just say, I, I've been really, really sad, and um, it's just, well, it's the dream. Pastors get to walk. Um, thank you for your prayers for me. Pray for the guiding leadership team that will become the mission exploration team that will draw on you as the future unfolds. I am. Um, I asked uh, Katie to help me with a song. God bless uh, Steve Joyle and Jerry Wallenstein. We're going to do this, but uh, <laughs> if they're going to have to put up with us. I'm sure it's not familiar. <laughs> we haven't done this one time where I've made it through without breaking down in tears. So. A song to help us think about um, being between the times and to lean into the Holy Spirit.
Trust the movement of the century and still see the river flow between the tides. Between 